Well, praise the Lord. We are back again. Some of you were on vacation last week. Welcome back. Glad to have you back with us. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and we will get into our message this morning. Father, we've just sang songs of praise to you, exalting you, for you alone are worthy of all of our exaltation, all of our praise, all of our thanksgiving for all good things, all things that are perfect and good and true and right come from you. Father, we praise you and thank you that you have brought us here this morning to hear your word. It is a privilege and honor to proclaim your word and to hear your word proclaimed. Father, we are among few who gather in this nation this morning to hear your word preached. May the word of God not fall on deaf ears this morning. God, may we hear it and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your copy of the scriptures, turn to 1 Timothy and chapter 4. We're picking up right where we left off last week. We are picking up in verse 6. The title of the message this morning, Train Yourself for Godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Now, we're continuing in chapter 4. We left off. Um, verses 1 through 5, with a warning from the Spirit of God that in latter times there would be a great departing away from the faith. And now in verse 6, we pick up with Paul addressing Timothy directly. Now this passage, though it is addressing Timothy directly, it is a passage that raises a standard not only for pastors, but a standard for all believers to strive for. It is the highest of standards, godliness. In a world where standards and expectations are continually being lowered, God calls you, as his children, to the highest of standards, the standard of living a life of godliness. Now, there was a recent article in Psychology Today entitled... When all else fails, lower your standards. Another article read, can't find love, lower your standards. And a third article, avoid disappointment by lowering your standards. You see, the world today wants you to just give up. They want you to just lower your standards to the lowest common denominator. But God, church, has called you to a much higher standard than that. The world says, lighten up. Just sit back, plug in, be entertained, and zone out. God's standard for you, church, is much higher than that. It is a calling that requires not you lowering your standards, but raising your standards. You see, God's calling is a calling that requires work. It requires effort. It requires striving. It requires training. That is the standard that God is calling you to. See, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians compares the Christian life to that of an athlete. Let me turn there in 1 Corinthians for you for just a moment. We're familiar with this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul comparing the Christian life to that of an athlete. Christ, uh, chapter 9, starting in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You see, for the Christian, you are not to go through this life as a spectator. You're not to be aimless in your daily walk. You are to prepare yourself. You're to train yourself. You are to enter the arena of life, and you are to compete. You're to compete in the marketplace of ideas. As a Christian, you're to compete in education. 
As a Christian, you're to compete against false religions. We are to be God's people competing in the world, raising up a higher standard, influencing our culture in God's word and with God's standards of right and wrong. Well, how do we do that, Pastor? Well, let's turn to our text, 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Let's read it this morning. If you put these things before the brothers... So what are these things? Well, Paul's referring to the first three chapters of the book of Timothy. If you put those things, warning against false teachers, proclaiming that Christ, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, praying for all people, the qualifications for elders and deacons, the mystery of godliness. If you put these things, if you put the, the teachings of the doctrines that I've already laid out before you, if you put those things before the brothers, then... He says, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. You'll be a good servant of Jesus Christ. To those who walk in this world and teach others the word of God, to them he calls a good servant. And so as Paul teaches this passage to Timothy, he is to in turn teach it to others. You see, you might be a Sunday school teacher. You might teach a Sunday school lesson. Maybe you're a homeschool mom, and you're teaching God's word to your children. Maybe you're a grandparent reading a Bible story to your grandchildren. Maybe you're just a friend having a cup of coffee across from another person, and you teach a little Bible truth to that person. God says, when you do that, in doing that, you are a good servant of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus teaches his disciples about what a good and faithful servant is in a parable. He teaches that parable in Matthew chapter 25, picking up in verse 14, another familiar passage to us. He says, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also did he who had two talents. He made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled the counts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master." And also, those who, though the one who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I've made you two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over, faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you do not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. <clears throat> Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. Church, those who put forth the effort, those who invest in the kingdom of God, those who didn't just sit idly by through life and lower their standards, those who put in the work, those who were faithful, God rewards, calling them a good and faithful servant. Now, you might have extra time on your hands. The question is, well, what are you doing with that extra time? Are you investing it in the kingdom of God, or are you squandering it on useless things? When you invest your time in the kingdom of God, you are a good servant of Jesus Christ. Now, you might not have much extra time. You might be a very busy person, but you have financial means. What are you doing with those financial means? 
Are you investing them in the work of God, or are you squandering them on some useless temporal items? When you invest your treasure in God's kingdom, you are a good servant of Jesus Christ. Perhaps you are both busy and broke, but you have a talent. Are you using that talent to invest in God's kingdom? Are you using it to serve the body of Christ and the world? Are you setting forth an example of service to others by using that talent for him? If you are, you are a good servant of Jesus Christ. Now, there's some in here that just might be busy, broke, and untalented. Well, you can still tell others about Jesus Christ. You can still speak. You can still teach God's word to others. When you use your words to honor Christ, in turn, he says, you are a good servant of mine. Well done. Your words matter. Next, Paul says, to be trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Our words matter. We need to speak words of encouragement to one another, words of faith. We need to build one another up as believers in Christ. Words of faith that express love, that support one another through hard times because, church, the world is constantly trying to bring you down. The world is constantly trying to discourage you. And so we need to be building one another up. It should not surprise the Christian that our enemy, the devil, is out to destroy you, to discourage you, to disrail you. Each one of you have a part to play. The enemy is trying to isolate you, make you to feel aimless and alone. But church, we are, need to be here for one another. We need to be our support system for one another. God has called us to do that. God is with us. His words are given to us to comfort us and give us a purpose in this life. Each one of us have a part to play. His words of faith will help us to discover what that is. See, God has given us each a gift a talent to be used for him. God's word will help us to discover that. His word is powerful. Hebrews reminds us, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through the division of the soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and it discerns the thoughts and even the intentions of our hearts. There is nothing like it in the world. The word of God is active and living. And so what we preach and what we teach matters. Too many churches today are teaching psychology lessons rather than theology lessons. In fact, on one website called Millennial Outreach, they have a list of the top 10 sermon topics to reach millennials in 2022. Here's what they are. Top 10 sermon topics. One, mental health issues. Two, service to others. Three, dealing with doubts. Four, identity issues. Five, how to make a friend. Six, questions about God. Seven, women's rights. Eight, dealing with pregnancy. Nine, dating apps. And 10, humanitarian issues. These are the top 10 suggested sermon topics from a Christian publication called Millennial Outreach. Joseph Madera writes, because of this cultural shift away from theology, many people who attend Christian churches today have been trained to think that theology is not necessary, practical, or even connected to any other field of study. Worse yet, this has led pastors to preach messages that show they spend more time studying behavioralism than they do studying the scriptures. Many of the fastest growing churches today have pulpit preaching based upon self-help positive messages with or without 
a scripture verse as an appendage to the message. For most of America, the days of a pastoral preaching biblical doctrine have gone the way of the dinosaur. What we teach and what we preach matters. Verse number seven, have nothing to do with irreverent or silly myths. Paul tells Timothy, don't waste your time with all the chatter out there in the world. Church, we are inundated with more chatter than any generation has ever been inundated with before in the history of the world. Every day brings a new scandal. Every day brings a new gossip headline. Have nothing to do with them. They are meant to distract you and draw you away from the word and your pursuit of godliness. If there's one thing that will distract you away from your pursuit of godliness is involving yourself in the latest headline and gossips. Instead of spending your time on those things, Paul says, rather train yourself for godliness. Verse 8. He says, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for this present life and also for the life to come. Did you know that we live in a time where physical per perfection, the pursuit of physical perfection and looking good at all costs, as on an all-time high, there's a gym on every corner. And America spent, get this, America spent a staggering $28.6 billion last year on gym memberships alone. They spent another $6.4 billion on home exercise equipment. That's $35 billion spent in this country last year alone. Paul says there is some value, there are some benefits to physical exercise and eating right, taking care of our physical body. There's some benefits to that, and we all know and acknowledge that. But church, that is a massive amount of time, energy, and effort spent on staying fit, on looking good. $35 billion dollars. Imagine if that money was invested into the kingdom of God. Imagine how different this nation would look. He says, however, training ourselves in godliness not only have value for us here and advantages here in this life, the life that we're living now, but there is everlasting, eternal value to training ourselves in godliness. The benefits those benefits will carry on with us into eternity. So in verse 9, Paul says, This is saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Every Christian, in other words, should affirm that truth. So the question is, are you pursuing godliness? Verse 10, he says, For to this end we toil and strive, because we have set our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So church, are you toiling and striving toward godliness in your life? Are you making every effort to live a godly life? If not, then you are likely going the opposite direction. You're falling away. You're getting further and further from godliness into the abyss of compromise, sin, and despair. You see, the world system is not set up for your moral success. The world system, in fact, is set up for your moral failure. It advertises to appeal to your base sin nature, pulling you towards lies and envy and idolatry and adultery, immorality, the world system is set up to pull you away from godliness. So what are you doing 
to resist? What are, are you toiling and striving for godliness? Because if that effort is not being put forth in your life, then you are drifting away from godliness. That's why Paul is urging us to toil and strive. If the pursuit of godliness was easy, then he would not say toil and strive for it. It requires training ourselves to deny our flesh and to conquer that old sin nature. So what must we do? How do we train ourselves for godliness? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number one, the first thing that we must do to train ourselves for godliness is to set our hope not on the rise or fall of the stock market, not on the next election cycle. We're not to set our hope on whether or not we have good cell phone service. We are to set our hope, he says, on the living God. We are to set our hope on the living God. He's the living God. He's the creator of all things, sustainer of all life. Sovereign and omnipotent. There's nothing beyond his control. And so we set our hope not on temporal things that will fail us. We set our hope on that which is certain and eternal and secure. God himself. He is where we place our hope. He is the judge and he is the savior of the world. Paul says not only for those... He says... For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially for those who believe. See, he is the judge and the Savior of the world. Now this passage, he's not saying that God saves everybody. It's not universalism. Paul is not changing his theology here. But there is an aspect of God that saves everyone in this world. There is a protection, a security that God provides for every human being alive. In a very temporal way, God saves everyone from the punishment of their sin as they live this life. But in death, those who haven't come to faith in Christ will be judged. He's the Savior of all men. He's especially the Savior of those who believe. For after death, he pardons those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. They no longer will be set under his judgment, but will be released into eternal life because his son, Jesus Christ, took the punishment already for them on the cross. He purchased their pardon with his blood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that for whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves the world. But those who will be saved, the whosoever believes are the ones who will be saved. This is the first thing that we do to train ourselves for godliness. We set our hope on the living God. Secondly, we, how do we train ourselves for godliness? In our speech. We guard what we say. We filter what comes out of our mouths. We use our speech to build others up, to encourage them, to rebuke those who are in sin or error. But we use our speech for God. James says we are to tame our tongues. He says the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. That's how James describes the tongue. So if we want to prepare and train ourselves for godliness, we must watch our speech We must guard what we say. Thirdly, in our conduct, our lives are to be models of the life of Jesus Christ. We are to conduct ourselves in the same manner as our Lord Jesus did. He is the one who set the example for us. Paul, back in chapter 3 of this letter to Timothy, gave a list of the conduct of elders and deacons, which includes that they are to be above reproach non-violent, non-quarrelsome. They're to be sober-minded and self-controlled, hospitable and respectful. This is the conduct that we must strive for in our lives if we are training ourselves for godliness. Fourthly, in love. We're to let all that we do 
be motivated by love, by a genuine love that's expressed to others by helping them meet their needs. So if we see a need in a brother or sister in Christ, we go out of our way to meet that need, which is an expression of love. Those who act in such a manner are training themselves in godliness. Fifth, in faith. In order to train ourselves in godliness, it requires we exercise our faith. Our faith in God, our faith in his word, our faith in his church. His perfect plan that we don't understand fully, but we exercise faith, especially when things are not going the way that we plan. When your day, a roadblock is set up in your day and you're not able to do what you need to do, Trust his plan. That is when we exercise faith. We're not to get angry. We're to exercise faith. We're not to doubt. We're not to be in despair and depression. We are to trust God's plan. Even though we're uncertain about what it is fully in our lives, we trust him. And so as we do that, as obstacles come in our way, as situations that we didn't expect to rise in our lives, we exercise faith. And when we do that, we are training ourselves in godliness. These are the times when we toil and strain towards godliness. Six, in purity. In a life of purity, the person that's training themselves for godliness must resist the temptation to sin. Sin is ever before you. Every moment of the day, our actions, our thoughts, our speech, we always have the opportunity and the possibility, the temptation is always there for us to fall into sin. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to leave the world and go live on a monastery on the top of a mountain because sin is already there. If you're there, sin's there. It does mean that we are to be sensitive to that inner voice, the conscience that God has given you. See, the word of God bears testimony to the truth and your conscience bears witness to that. And when we break that, when we, we are tempted to sin, that alarm bell goes off that God has graciously given to us, giving us an opportunity to resist and flee that sin. The world is always making new ways to entice you. That is what they do. They're making new ways to draw you in and to tempt you to sin. And today, we have the added pressure of carrying around our little pocket size idol factories. So we have that added temptation that is always there with us. Just a click or a swipe away. You know, church, this artificial intelligence that they're creating is being created to lay a trap for you. Every moment of every day, they're setting traps. We must be cautious to avoid those traps if we are pursuing godliness. Again, we must toil and strive towards godliness lest we fall away. The person who's training themselves for godliness must be committed to a life of self-control and purity. In closing, verses 15 and 16, he says, Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Notice the language he uses here. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, in the teaching. Persist. In doing this, look, church, there is no stopping in your pursuit of godliness, in your training yourself for godliness. This must be an ongoing thing that is a, becomes a daily habit in your life. So it's going to require work. 
It's going to require self-control. It's going to require that you raise the standards in your life, though the world is calling you to do exactly the opposite. Forget about all that. What do you need to do that for? That's way too hard. Let's just, you know, live life and enjoy life. Not to say that pursuit of godliness isn't a joyful pursuit. It is a difficult one, but it is one that will be far more rewarding than anything else that you can pursue in your life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have set us on a course. From the moment that you regenerated our hearts and made us new, called us to be your children, you have set us on a course to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That our life might be a life of toil and striving, but not for selfish gain, for godliness that we might set examples for, this, for the rest of the world who are pursuing the desires of their flesh, who are falling into depression and despair, and who will look to us as a light on a hill that they are drawn to for the life that we lead and for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for giving us that hope and that mission in life. Now, Lord, as we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper, this beautiful picture of Christ's sacrifice for us, help us in our pursuit of godliness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.